Welcome to the LATAM MedTech Leaders Podcast, a conversation with leaders who have succeeded or plan to succeed in Latin America. Please subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher, etc. Today, our guest is Michael Hill, or I should say Dr. Michael Hill, right? <laughs> a former executive at Medtronic for over seven, 27 years a now a partner at Science Innovations LLC, a medical consulting firm that partners with medtech companies, big or small, to bring therapy and technology innovations to the market. So during Michael's 27 year career, has, he has consistently championed the Latin or Latin American opportunity in the innovation cycle, from speaking at the National Hispanic Medical Association, training of clinicians in Puerto Rico and Mexico, and novel medical device technologies, supporting first in human clinical trials in Chile and Colombia, participating in country specific market access team discussions, meeting with local regulatory and reimbursement officials, and consistently supporting the local people and teams in, in country. Dr. Hill or Michael Hill uh, received his bachelor's degree in biomedical and electrical engineering like me, <laughs> and another one in mathematics from Duke University. And he has a master's and a PhD degree in biomedical engineering from Case Western University and, a, and an MBA, master's of business administration from the University of St. Thomas, also like me. So <laughs> Michael, it's really, really a pleasure to have you here in the show. I look forward to our conversation. How do you yeah, doing Thank today? you, thank you, good to be here. Awesome, so let's get started, Michael. Um, please tell listeners about your involvement with Latin America. How do you get involved with the region in a personal, professional level? Yeah, I have been involved with Latin America throughout my whole career. So even as a scientist, when I started at Medtronic, um, I actually started working with several different research people um, in um, Latin America. And so we actually were, you know, I love to travel. And so I, I enjoy traveling quite a bit. And I spent some time over in Europe. And our European groups were actually well connected with Latin America as well as with Japan at the time. And so I actually started interacting quite a bit with some of the people who were doing atrial fibrillation research down in Latin America. And so even at that very early beginning, I started working with Latin America. Um, it continued with my clinical and regulatory experience. Um, so we actually, even up to the last three years that I was at Medtronic, I had the um, whole global clinical organization report into me and that included Latin America as a geography. And um, we have the largest, at Medtronic, they have the largest uh, CRO, if you will, for clinical <laughs> research. Wow. Um, over 800 people worldwide for all really? the operations. Nobody and knows so, that. <laughs> know. So we have a lot of people in Latin America, feet on the ground, um, but you know we can do um, clinical trials. We had probably you know, 100 trials in Latin America at one point with over 500 to 800 um, subjects. Um, wow. So we spent quite some time and energy in Latin America. But country by country specific, as we'll talk as we go through. Excellent, Michael. All right. So what major trends do you see happening in the region from the disease standpoint, political, economic, that are beneficial to our discussion or beneficial to newer medical device companies doing business, uh, doing trials or commercializing medical technologies? Yeah. You know, it, it, just like much of the rest of the world, the population is aging. And so everywhere you have aging. Now, again, it's country specific and there's more aging in certain countries than in other countries, um, but we are aging as an overall population. That's a good thing from a longevity standpoint, but it also means that we are starting to now move from communicable diseases to other things like the whole Western, you know, cardiac disease, neurological disease, stroke, things like that. And so those are areas where more specific types of therapies are needed. We know a lot of what they are, but we need to have access. So that's one part. The other part is the economy. You know, people think, well, can I make money, if you will, in Latin America? And the answer is yes, you can. In fact, there's a lot of money in Latin America. Um, to say it bluntly, and I think this is not just Latin America, it's the whole world, politics plays the role in whether that economy is good or not. So stable politics means good economy. And you can look at different countries that have been stable, such as Chile. And Chile, we actually have very good reimbursement for e even very high-end products like pacemakers and defibrillators. And so stability matters when you think of politics. And that's why it's important to look at how those things change over time. Very good. Yes, yes, I agree. All right, Michael. So 
what's your overall perception uh, about Latin America as a place to do business, as a place to do human trials, as a place to commercialize medical technologies in general? What do you think? Are you positive? Are you upbeat about the region or what? Yeah. So, you know, it, it can be a very good place for clinical research. Um, you know, it's I, I'm a people person. And so I think that Latin America operates as a people or, you know, as people. They like relationships. And I think that's a very important thing. The other interesting part is Spanish is the second most common language in the world. First is actually Chinese. So English is actually third. It's not the, it's not the first. So, you know, the, most people speak Spanish. And so from an overall, you know, interaction of people, um, you know, that's a great population that is probably untapped from an overall global standpoint. Now, I would say one thing. It's a great place to do clinical research, but do consider your exit strategy or sustainability. So what I mean by that is, is remember, if you're doing something like a 510K or what we would call that in the U.S., you know, those you might say, you know, well, you do something and then you take it away. So it's a it's a surgical dressing or a external diagnostic device. So you might only follow the patient for 24 hours or 30 days. But if it's something that's implantable, such as a pacemaker or a stent, you might need to think ethically what's the right thing to do. And you might be saying, okay, it's a clinical study of a year, but your sustainability and your responsibility is to be there for the life of the patient. And so that's just something to consider when you start to move into those areas to think, what do I mean by doing clinical research in Latin America? The need is there. Access is very well received. It's just making sure that there's the exit or the sustainability strategy. Well said. Yeah, Michael. All right. So let's uh, talk about your experience in individual countries. Um, let's talk about, uh, I understand you have great experience in Mexico, Colombia, um, uh, Chile, even Puerto Rico. So let's talk about that. Let's start with Mexico. So okay. what you did so, in Mexico. Yeah. So, you know, um, I did, I have traveled. In fact, I think I was trying to put a list together of some of the countries. So, you know, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Argentina, Panama, Mexico, um, and Puerto Rico, <laughs> like I said, is the, is the brother, right? In right. Uruguay, in Uruguay and as well. So, you know, I've been to a lot of the Latin American countries and, you know, Mexico is an interesting one. You know, there you actually have self-pay for a lot of device work. So medical devices, a lot of self-pay, especially high end. So a pacemaker, yes. people have to buy. Yeah. Right? yeah. And so um, I actually spent quite a bit of time in Mexico training on a new type of defibrillator that had an added therapy for heart failure called, called cardiac resynchronization therapy, which I helped to bring forward as an innovation. And so I spent time going through. In fact, oftentimes at some of the regional um, cardiac society meetings, I was the only English language um, <laughs> presentation, um, but it, it was great because I got to print, present to large groups, but then I also got to work side by side with clinicians yeah. in, in the lab, and that was great. Um, if I take another example, um, where heart failure, um, that was actually where we actually went to Colombia, and hmm. the, the head of the Heart Failure Society of Latin America at the time was a female physician from Colombia. Nice. And so we met with her at the Heart Failure, uh, Heart Failure Society meeting here in the U.S. Um, she was very interested in starting to do remote monitoring of patients to see if we could keep them out of the hospital or keep them from having an exacerbation of heart failure. Yeah. And so we did a study there in Columbia um, using remote monitoring to actually look at several patients and trying to keep them out of the hospital due to the heart failure problems. Okay. Do you, and then do you know what hospital it was? Do you remember? Um, uh, I don't. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I can find it out, but oh, I, yeah. It's, it's probably um, Fundacion Cardio Infantil in Bogota, something like that. Yeah, we're within name. Bogota. I don't remember the physician's yeah. name. That's what I was trying yeah. to think of. But yeah, but, but the hospital, Bogota has one of the top cardiovascular centers in Latin America, probably Fundacion Cardio Infantil. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're great to work with. I mean, just yeah. as an institution yeah. as well, they were actually excellent to work yes. with. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then the last one was. Um, Micra. So Micra is the world's smallest pacemaker. It's a transvenously implanted. It actually goes through a femoral um, insertion through a sheath, and it's implanted into the right ventricle. And it's a fully functional VVIR pacemaker for 10 years. And it's about the wow. volume of one cc. Wow. Um, so huh. it's released with tines into the ventricular wall. It stays there, um, but it's fully operational. And the very, we did a 760 patient global study um, in order to get regulatory approval because this had never really been done as a pacemaker before. And so the first patients implanted 
were on the same day and they were in Chile and in Austria. And so our very first implant in our clinical trial of 760 patients was in Chile. Wow, so that's fascinating. It was, it was really great to be able to work there and to get yeah. things done there too. And, to, and the excitement of being the first in sure. one of Latin American countries. So that was actually really nice. Yeah, yeah. So Michael, um, I understand you have experience in heart disease, mental health, diabetes, by looking at the the notes that I have uh, from our conversation uh, before the show. So can you talk about that? I mean, these other areas, mental health. I mean, that's a fascinating topic nowadays uh, with the pandemic, right? Yeah, well, you know, it is. And different countries have different needs. Um, you know, we, we actually formed a, a very interesting group for our Latin American team. Um, so I will name a few names here that, of people that I think are very important that are still ex -med, or with Medtronic. But Hugo Fagioli, um, who actually is the director of clinical for LATAM. Um, Hugo Viega, who is the general manager and vice president for Latin American Geography. And then Rafa Cosas, who is Rafael Cosas, who is the um, vice president of marketing access. And so they actually were very um, collaborative, if I, if I should say. And they were actually interested in getting a team together. And it consisted of marketing people um, in Latin America. It consisted of the clinical research people. Um, we in the regulatory people, the reimbursement people, and the government affairs people. And then we started targeting the different countries. And we looked at both their clinical need, as well as what their business opportunities were, as well as the difficulties or burden or, or you know, burdens we'd have to overcome in order to operate there. And so, for example, Brazil, which has a lot of difficulty in regulatory problems, but they have a huge experience in some of the neurological spaces. And so they actually started some of the very earliest um, denervation and, and, and working in the neurons along the spine. Some of the surgeons in Brazil, they were doing some of this work 20 years ago, very novel, innovative research work. So that's you know, something going on there. Um, like I said, Colombia was great with the heart failure because of the physicians that we were working with there and the remote monitoring piece. Um, you know, it's, it's just different places worked very differently, but it was great to see how we could target certain places. You know, Mexico was great for our surgical group because we could actually expand and, you know, they, they do a lot of just normal surgery in, uh, in Mexico. And so having the equipment from our acquisition at that time of Covidian really expanded our access into Mexico. Um, and we were basically in every single hospital in Mexico. Wow. And so it was a great, great opportunity. Wasn't the stent invented in Argentina? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. 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 Yeah, I mean, that's something that very few people know, I think, uh, yeah, of all yeah. places, Argentina. Well, well, Argentina. And so, you know, and also the atrial fibrillation work. So I actually worked with a physician from, um, he was in Alabama um, at the University of Alabama. He moved up to Case Western before I moved there. Um, and he was working on atrial fibrillation. Okay. But in fact, there were several people from Argentina that actually were working a lot on atrial fibrillation as well, on atrial fibrillation ablation and the whole area of how to do, uh, you know, how to treat patients with atrial fibrillation, which is probably the worst arrhythmia that um, is in the cardiac space and leads to, as you age, to probably most of the strokes that occur in elderly patients. And so it's actually uh, something that was done quite a bit in Argentina as well. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So, Michael, um, an area of interest to me and a lot of listeners is clinical research, specifically first in human. Let's talk about the 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 reason why companies leave the United States or Europe, and 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 we we should probably talk also about the UMDR and the repercussions in Latin America. Is Latin America going to benefit from what's happening now in Europe with the UMDR or not? I would like to get your thoughts on that mm -hmm. too. But first, let's talk about the United States. I mean, why is it that companies are looking at places like Latin America or Eastern Europe to do early feasibility clinical work? Yeah, you know, it, it's easy to say that it's cheaper, but that's that's not the only reason, and that would be the wrong reason to do it only. Okay, and what I mean by that is, is it's important to have if you're doing clinical research. Clinical research is important to have quality and also to have people on the ground. And so, you know, for us, we were lucky because we did have a small handful of clinical people that lived in country and worked and did our work for us. Now, we did work with some of the CROs. Um, sometimes it was easier, especially if we expanded in a country. We did a stent study um, and we actually hired a CRO in Brazil because, I mean, we were at probably, you know, 
15 clinical sites and we just had one person there in Brazil. So, we, so it works out very well that way. But, you know, you, you need to make sure that you have the, you know, capability to work there locally. But, it, it, you know, it's, it's an important aspect to understand. One other thing that I wanted to mention was about, you know, culturally, Latin America is, as I mentioned before, very people oriented. Um, and the reason I mentioned that is because relationships are essential to be motivated and successful. And so to do that, you put your trust in these relationships. So you have to build these relationships. It sounds very soft, but I tell people, actually, it's not soft skills at all. This is the hardest skills to have usually. So you know, trust is put into relationships rather than contracts or transactional events as in other parts of the world. So, you know, if you operate in Japan or if you operate in Germany, um, those tend to be a little bit more transactional, even in the U.S., right? I mean, people in the U.S. will do business with people that they don't like, even though they know they can make money. And maybe that's maybe, maybe saying it. <laughs> but, but it's just that, you know, it's important to build that trust because that trust is what ha helps the motivation and the success. And we have been very successful with quality in Latin America. So, you know, we did that when we expanded into Eastern Europe. And I can tell you, when we, when we expanded into Poland and Hungary and into other parts of um, and Slovakia and, and everyone, yeah, we, we, had, we had the best quality of our clinical team. I mean, we almost had no errors, nothing. And the same in Latin America. I mean, the Chile group that we had there, again, just, you know, they had very few, few changes or, or errors that we found when they were monitored in the clinical trial. And so, you know, that was very nice to see, especially when, you know, unfortunately, there were other centers that you would think did very, you know, should be good centers we worked with before. So, you know, in, here in Barcelona or in, uh, in New York, and quite frankly, you know, they may enroll several patients, but on the other hand, they also have lots of findings. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I was just reading an article, uh, actually it was a research paper an academic paper uh, in the, the argument of the uh, paper, Michael, was why is it that companies uh, want to go outside of the United States offshore? Clinic, uh, I mean, that, that's the term they use, offshoring of clinical trials. Why is it want to go outside of the United States? And um, the argument is most people think it's price, as you correctly say. Mm -hmm. Most people think it's price, but it's really about patient recruitment and quality. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's a lot easier to recruit patients. And, and, and one of the reasons why it's a lot easier to recruit patients, and correct me if I, you, you have a different perspective, is that patients in Latin America and places in, in Eastern Europe may have lesser options, right? right? So mm -hmm. in the U.S., you have 20 FDA-approved treatment options for any right. disease or any illness. So... Uh, even if uh, it delays the management of your pain for 20 more years. I mean, you don't want to uh, subject okay. yourself to the invasive procedure or anything if you can avoid yeah. it, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, you do want to be very um, objective when you do a clinical trial. And, you know, you hope that the result is going to be positive. And believe me, I've done studies, great studies, where the result has been profound, you know, mortality benefit. We've also done studies, large studies, where we found absolutely zero change. Mm. Mm -hmm. I, and so those are disappointing, but they yeah. happen sometimes. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you go into it with, with eyes wide open, but you're absolutely right. In many of the um, underserved countries, um, patients are very willing to actually try for trying to do something. And that also, yeah. I think, is part of the reason that ethically it's important to have that sustainability or at least that exit strategy mm -hmm. that's there. Yes. Because patients will be willing to do things and try things because there's hope and there's an opportunity yeah. Um, many of the clinical trials, these things are offered at, um, free of charge, even diagnostic, yes. and stuff, which yeah. can be very beneficial. Um, but on the other hand, I think we do have a responsibility, a societal responsibility to think about it ethically and make sure that we're doing it for the right reasons. But you are right. You know, we did a study in Serbia um, way back when, and it was a pacemaker study, simple pacemaker yeah. study. We mm -hmm. enrolled 76 patients in Serbia. Mm in like two months. Right? <laughs> and, and part of it is also economy because, you know, the Serbian government, their allocation, because they are a government paid, um, you know, insurance, um, they only allow for a certain amount of high end device implants. Ah. Research is beyond that. Right. And so it wasn't taking up their quota of 
implant devices. Yeah. And some of the Latin American countries operate that way as well. Yeah. But it is different in different countries. Interesting. Yes. And um, also the the physician patient relationship is different in Latin America. Would you say so? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, my, my brother is a country, doctor. Yes. Yeah. yes, my brother is a doctor here in the United States. He's a cardiologist, interventional cardiologist. And he says, Julio, sometimes I get patients that come to my office with 200 pages of Google searches <laughs> and they just want to uh, uh, have a discussion with me. <laughs> they don't want me to tell them what to do. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, you know, it, it, it depends yeah. a little bit on the finances, right? So I'll go back to Mexico for an example. You know, in Mexico, it is patient pay. And as you know, I, my whole experience has been in the high end kind of cardiovascular devices. And so when they, you know, I've helped several, you know, friends who are Mexican think through the situation of how do we actually purchase the right pacemaker for granddad, right? And so, you know, the doctor says that they need this kind of pacemaker. And so, you know, they say, well, you know, it's like buying a car. You can get the, you know, the, the, the Maserati, you can get the Rolls Royce, you can get the BMW, yeah. you can get the Volkswagen, you can get the Yugo or whatever, yeah. you know, or, or yeah. you can get the scooter, right? <laughs> and so it, it's, you know, because there's a lot of pacemakers, but what's the right thing for the patient? Yeah. And, you know, oftentimes, you know, Latin America is probably a little bit more trusting in that area than say India, for example. I mean, in India, people don't trust the physician. That's right? fascinating. That's so, a good insight. Yeah, they, I didn't know they, that. Yeah, yeah, they, 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 you know, if, if the physician tells them something, they go get a second opinion, okay. right? Because they don't know if the physician is just trying, because again, it's a lot of self pay, right? Are they just trying to make money? Do I really need the echo? Do I really need this test? Um, and so Mexico can be a little bit like that, but it's because, it, you know, when it's something serious like a pacemaker implant, you want to make sure that it's the right thing for sure. your grandfather. Yeah, and yeah. so having the right opinions and discussions are important. Yes. And the other issue why patients enroll quickly in clinical research, uh, Michael, I think, is because of the care that a patient receives in a clinical study versus the care that he receives in the universal healthcare system of every country, because as you and I know, pretty much all countries in Latin America have, has a, a single payer system, a universal healthcare system that covers a big percentage of the population. Countries like Mexico have five different healthcare mm -hmm. systems, one mm -hmm. for the military, another mm -hmm. one for the teachers, mm -hmm. <laughs> et cetera. So um, I, I think uh, that's something that I've seen a lot, specifically in Colombia, uh, because uh, the system covers 95, 96% of the population. It's one of the top performing systems in Latin America, by the way. However, access to the system is sometimes difficult. You have to stay in line for since three in the morning to get an appointment to see a general or family doctor and for him to refer you to the specialist and then another uh, three hour wait in line from three in the morning, you know, and then going to the drugstore, you have to stay in line for a couple hours to get access to the drugs. So you know, on a clinical trial, you don't have any of this because they send an Uber driver mm -hmm. <laughs> to pick you yep. up. It, yep, it facilitates the care. Yep, it facilitates the care. Absolutely. Exactly, exactly. That's another reason why patients are encouraged to, to join clinical trials. Anyway, Michael, so let's uh, talk about the UMDR. I'm very curious about what's happening in Europe and how Latin America could benefit from it. What, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. Well, you know, it's a, uh, so I've spent a lot of my, second half of my career in talking to uh, regulatory bodies, in fact. I mean, I've spoken to the CFDA, to the PMDA, to the Health Canada, to, um, you know, the group in um, Australia, um, you know, the FDA, as well as certain notified bodies in Europe. And I've even spoken three times, I think, to the European Parliament. Um, and most of that is not because I see regulators as the enemy. In fact, I see them as great partners in what we do. I mean, their mission is very similar to ours in pr promoting and protecting you know, public health. Um, what I do ask for is better harmonization. <laughs> um, and the reason is because, you know, if we have to do five large trials in different geographies just to get local approval, that is five times the cost for us to bring something out that from a physiological standpoint, most of the time is almost very identical. Now, not always. 
So there are care practices differences. I don't. I agree with that. I understand that. But there are fundamental times when you know we have to carry out large studies, and we've done that um, in different geographies just to bring them to market, and that can be very expensive. So harmonization is one key that I really push for. Now the EMDR, um, you know, it actually is um, going to cost a lot of money. Um, <laughs> um, basically to keep things on the market that are already there. And people are estimating, you know, it, it's a lot of money. I mean, in the multi-millions, just to keep products that are already there on the market. Now, I'm an opportunistic person. Um, I'm always very optimistic and very, you know, but I am realistic. But one of the opportunities that also helps us do is look at our, our um, supply of devices and things that are there. And what are the things that we should obsolete? Right. So we are, it's hard to take things off the market. And so, you know, we actually have gone through, or at least Medtronic, when I was there, um, in fact, part of the EUMDR, I sat on this, the council at Medtronic to help decide how we were going to operate and what we we're going to do with it. And um, we actually have, had a great plan. We actually talked to all the business units, all the regions. And so we did look at how we could actually take certain products off the market and move into where we could streamline our manufacturing because a lot of that approval ba is based on manufacturing. And if you have special manufacturing lines, that makes it difficult, especially even trying to gr grandfather anything in. So a lot of money spent, um, still spending a lot of money um, in trying to do that. And for Latin America, you know, from my standpoint, what that can benefit, there's, I guess there's two things. One, again, depending on how you count Puerto Rico, <laughs> um, you know, Puerto Rico is going to be a very interesting opportunity here because Puerto Rico, of course, is a manufacturing powerhouse for the United States. And as it gets closer to statehood and as people look more at, as it as an opportunity to become more inclusive with the United States, um, the tax haven that it once was will go away. Um, and so much of that means a possibility of opportunity for Latin America. Um, we have moved into Mexico to do manufacturing. We have moved into other places to do manufacturing. Costa Rica, I yeah. imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if there's place, you know, so that's actually an opportunity because of the problem. It was just like in Europe where Ireland, um, you know, once yes. they became part of the EU, yeah. Ireland, yeah. now everybody does business in Ireland and manufacturing is done in Ireland. And we do too for most of Europe. So it, it became a very nice tax haven. Now that's starting to wane away. And so people are looking at where do we move? Um, you know, back way before my time, it was it was Belgium. So we moved, Belgium, from, Belgium, really? we moved from Belgium to Ireland for a lot of our manufacturing. But that okay. was almost before my time. <laughs> OK, <laughs> fascinating how things change. So, all right. So that's manufacturing. Um, Latin America may benefit. Uh, this is an interesting take. I've never heard that before. And I think it's very valid and uh, different. I, I, I didn't see that perspective. However, what about clinical research or commercialization of medical technologies? Yeah, well, you know, um, we will have to, of course, get, it depends on how the Latin American countries look at the EUMDR. Um, you know, some of the countries have their own approval process. Some actually have, you know, once you get um, um, competent authority, I mean, once you get um, CE mark, then you can actually bring it in and import it. So it depends on how they look at the new regulations and whether they accept them or not. Well, again, because I want harmonization, what I'm concerned about is if the Latin American countries start to change their regulations on top of or at the, in the follow through from the EUMDR, it could make it even more difficult to actually do that. Um, because again, I want streamlining. I want people to agree that this is the, you know, the, the, the bar that we have to reach. And then once we reach that, we can import it into, you know, Brazil, we can import it into Paraguay, we can in you know, Ecuador, as well as, you know, um, uh, you know, Israel and wherever else. So that, that's the problem. So the EUMDR is causing a lot. Now, we, does it mean we can do a lot of clinical trials? We are. And Latin America can be part of that, at least from a Medtronic standpoint, they will be because oftentimes when we do these studies, they are global. Um, but believe me, we are trying to minimize them. Um, and we're working very closely because those can be expensive when it's just yeah. to keep the products that are already exactly. on the market. Exactly, yes. Th that's, that's what's behind my question, Michael, because um, it may happen that there's an overflow of clinical research in Europe. I mean, 
how many sites are in Poland? Only a few. I mean, in Lithuania. So companies mm -hmm. will start thinking about, that's, this is my, my take. That's right. Companies mm -hmm. could start thinking about Latin America as a place to, for the overflow. Okay, so we, we, we can only have three sites in Poland, only Lithuania. Let's do two sites in Colombia, three in Chile, because uh, these sites in Poland are so busy that... <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I tell you, you know, but, but, but there is a little bit of a competition. So, you know, India and China and Latin America, I, I still see as opportunities, right? And so China is, I mean, China still is one of the fastest growing economies. It's just incredible. Um, you know, for Medtronic, we have grown from probably 10 years ago, we probably had 50 people there. We have over 5,000 employees. 5,000. So, I mean, and it's grown and it's, and the growth has just been incredible. Now, India, we've also grown, but India is a little bit more chaotic. Um, a little <laughs> bit more, it's just not as well integrated as well, but there's okay. lots of opportunity. Latin America, I mean, those are countries. Right. Yeah. America is a bunch of countries. Yeah. Thirty three so, or something. Yeah. Yeah. And so trying to say, you know, where you're going into Latin America, it means you're really opening up a can of worms because we're where in Latin America. Exactly. Going? Yeah. You cannot think about Latin America as a one unified region. Right. right. But there, there will something... be opportunities like you mentioned. Yeah. I mean, I think Chile, Costa Rica, um, Mexico, Colombia, um, those are places where certainly clinical studies can pretty well straightforward be done very, very easily. And I also think that that mentality that US startups had, that uh, they they will say EU, EU first, that was their approach. We develop a product, a device, and then we seek CE mark approval first, EU, EU first. And then we commercialize, we get acquired, and we let the, uh, buyer, Medtronic, Boston Scientific, handle or deal with the FDA and invest the millions that are needed for the pivotal or the big trials in the United States. And, and, and I guess now the mentality will change. The paradigm will change. It's going to be United States first, probably, because it's probably be as, as difficult to get approval in Europe as it is to yeah. get in the, in yeah. the well, United well, you States. Know, you Germany, so? Germany, Germany over the last 20 years has done that, right? So, you know, in the past, Germany usually was the very first place in Europe that we could do a clinical implant. Okay. Um, and then Bee Farm came along, and that happened probably about 15 years ago. And I would say now Germany is the last country that we can get started in a clinical study in, in Europe. <laughs> and wow. so their approval process has become so burdensome that it's just, it, I mean, literally Germany used to be the best place when I started, you know, 30 years ago. And wow. it's just changed, it literally. And so that caused a lot of change. Germany is the largest economy in Europe. Yeah, yeah. And so there's a lot of physicians who want to do the research and want to do the implants. And, you know, when you're doing a 100 patient study and they implant patient 99, then, you know, yeah. it, they finally got approval on the last day of the study. And, <laughs> you know, and somebody in Poland has, you know, 25 implants and somebody yeah. in Italy has 25 yeah. implants. Um, it, it's tough. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's one of those things where it really does matter. And people will make those decisions to go because speed is important. Um, speed is money and time. You know, you say money and time are the most important things. And I always yeah. say, well, time is the only thing that's important <laughs> because time is money. Time is money. Yes, I agree. So I agree. You're really yeah. only talking about time. And if yeah. you could actually go to Latin American countries and do a even an EU approval study, um, you know, to get your initial CE mark, um, because again, we do global studies. Um, so it's not uncommon to have that happen anyway, where we would include, you know, a couple of centers in Latin America, a couple of centers in a European country, depending on what it is, yes. um, just to get the CE mark approval. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the, the other um, thing that i like to get your thoughts on is, would you think that companies will look at Latin America as a place to commercialize their innovations before the, the EU? I mean, American companies. If I were an American company and I see how difficult and expensive and I see all these notified bodies that are, can, cannot keep up with the demand, some of them are going out of business, they have to be recertified and, and the number have been reduced mm. dramatically, right? Yeah, yeah you have then, to follow the money though, right? So what I mean by that is Brazil has lots of money, but it's hard to do business there in the healthcare yeah. space. 
Yeah. And so that's the difficulty. If there was a country like in the old days, Germany, that had lots of money and they were easy to access, then I think it would flood in. But, you know, you, you look at some of the countries. And so, you know, Colombia may be a possibility. Costa Rica may be a possibility. You know, but then there's the economic problems of Argentina and, and Venezuela. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, so, yeah. so it, it, you do have to look. Um, because you need both that financial. You're going to follow the money, and then you need the time. So Colombia yeah. could be, Costa Rica could be, um, Chile a little bit, a yeah. Chile a little bit. Yeah. Like I said, we get yeah. great reimbursement in Chile, to be perfectly mm. honest. Um, mm. You know, they they are a great country to do it. They're very stable economy, stable yeah. politics, and it works pretty well. Awesome. Well, Michael, we're close to the end of the show. It's been a delightful conversation. So the last uh, question that I have for you is a question I usually ask uh, my guests is, if you had the CEO of a medical or a newer medical device company in front of you, what would you say to him or she or to her? I'm sorry. Um, what would be your most more source of wisdom <laughs> yeah. Yeah. about Latin thinking, America? Yeah, you know, definitely look at LATAM when you're ready to expand, you know, but do your homework, right? Each country has specific marketing, regulatory, reimbursement, clinical needs, right? So find the ones that match your sweet spot. So if you have a sweet spot, if your device, you know, 510K, whatever it is, um, and then, you know, spend lots of time on building trust relationships locally. So, you know, to me, I can't under underscore that, you know. Make sure that you look at the different countries, find out where your sweet spot is, because maybe you have something that's, you know, like I said, lots of surgeries are going on in Mexico and they're really good at it, right? Um, if you want to do brain stimulation, you know, there's only three countries that really do well with that. What about diabetes? Diabetes is rampant everywhere, but there's probably four countries in Latin America where diabetes is reimbursed and it's actually important and the government recognizes it, right? And so you know, target correctly, and then try to build those trust relationships locally. Excellent, Michael. Great comments. Thank you so much, Michael. It's been a great uh, conversation, and I'm sure listeners got a lot out of it. Uh, how can listeners get in contact with you at your company? Or? Yep, yep, yep. So, you know, best way is LinkedIn. So it's uh, Michael R.S. Hill. So that's the, you know, LinkedIn, like, piece that you put in there or search on. So it's Michael R.S. Hill. That's the best way to do it. And, you know, I just I just wanted to mention one final thing before we go. Yes. And, you know, that is, you know, as I mentioned about time, if you truly want to speed up innovation and grow your business, um, you know, collaborate. Seek diverse thoughts and share knowledge. You know, knowledge is power. Um, most businesses make mistakes or fail because of poor timing of sharing critical information. And so what I find is, is that people withhold information and bad decisions are made and businesses fail. And so people need to collaborate more. You think, well, you know, it's competitive, it's competitive, it's competition. And yeah, I get it. I mean, I worked at the largest medical device company in the world for, you know, almost 30 years. It's truly competitive, but you have to collaborate. You have to collaborate with regulators, with other companies, with people locally. There's a lot of collaboration and that collaborative approach will go far. And also finding out different opinions. Um, if you think you're always right, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so, well said. <laughs> All right, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Really appreciate it. Appreciate it.